It is so good and right to celebrate Jesus. Yeah. He's holy. There is none like him. He's entirely set apart. And he's called us together in this place today. Well, I want to say good morning, everyone. It is uh, good to see you. And uh, to those of you who are watching by live stream or watching online, we want to welcome you. And by the way, this morning, could we thank the tech team that contributes so generously to making live stream and message video available? Could we just thank them? (laughs) Many years ago, I heard a story about a young mom who had uh, two very mischievous boys. She loved them very much. She was uh, kind of beside herself to know what to do. At times, at times they seemed almost incorrigible. And so she had talked to a number of people about what could I do? And, And she got a suggestion from someone that perhaps she should take the two boys to her pastor. And so she did that, set up an appointment, and on the appointed day, took the two boys in. And when the two boys arrived, the pastor decided to meet with them one at a time. So uh, one is seated in a chair just outside the office, and then the other one comes into the pastor's office, is seated. The pastor sits behind his desk, and he says to the young boy, Son, where is God And the little boy was uh, taken aback by the question, and the pastor pressed it again. Son, where is God? Now the little guy is getting a little uncomfortable and starting to squirm a bit in his chair. The pastor presses the question one more time. Son, where is God? At that point, the little guy jumped out of his chair, ran out of the office, grabbed his brother, and he said, they've lost God and they're trying to pin it on us. (laughs) Well, at Grace Church, God is not missing. He's graciously and wonderfully present here. And for those of us who've come into relationship with him through Jesus, having found him and all that he is for us, we want to share him with the world. And we want to do it together, side by side. We are learning that there are some investments each of us can make that could contribute in some way to the health of the church so that the church might be increasingly healthy and so that Jesus might be powerfully displayed through our corporate life together. Currently, here at Grace, the fellowship is engaged in a six-week teaching series. It's a series in which there is some collaboration between the Sunday morning teaching time and life groups that happen throughout the week. And during this series, we're considering six commitments, six covenant commitments we could each make aimed at helping the church move toward greater measures of vitality. Been utilizing a little book written by... uh, a Christian leader named Tom Rayner, I want to be a church member. This is week four of six in this series. And what we're seeing in this series as we move through it together is that satisfying church membership emphasizes giving rather than getting. Ironically, the people who receive most through engagement with the church are people who invest most of themselves. It's a paradox in the kingdom of God. Throughout these weeks, we're discovering that Jesus has called us to thoughtfully and lovingly invest in his church, each of us investing for the health of the whole. Personal relationship with Jesus was never intended by God to be a strictly private relationship. We've talked about that. While it's very personal, this relationship with the Lord, God never intended for it to be private, disconnected 
from others. While followers of Jesus belong to him, by virtue of belonging to him, we also belong to others who have trusted him. We're family. Rugged individualism may be an esteemed value in American culture, but you're hard-pressed to see it championed in the New Testament. In the church, we have a shot through our corporate life together to display the glory of Jesus to the world in ways that we could never accomplish on our own. We are, indeed, better together. That's God's design. The Grace Church as a fellowship orients around a mission. When you walk in those center doors, it's, uh, it's above the doors. To know Christ and to make Christ known. And in this grand enterprise at Grace Church, the fellowship has for many, many years oriented around the gospel of Jesus, the message of good news. Jackie Hill Perry, whose transformation story is just breathtaking, writes this. It's on the screen. I was not to assume that the gospel was only an introduction to Jesus. I needed to cling to, meditate on, trust in, believe always this gospel daily with the same kind of unhindered desperation that led me to it the first time. In being anchored to the gospel, I would be holding on to God. Honestly, in fairness, I don't want to be presumptuous this morning and assume that all of us who walked into the room today have a gospel frame of reference. If you're here and you don't have really any frame of reference about the gospel, first of all, know we're so glad that you're here. You're always welcome in this place. People who are far from God are always welcome in this place to bring your curiosity and your questions. What I want to do this morning is I want to... Uh, simply and humbly attempt to summarize the good news of the gospel of Jesus. It's the truth foundation around which Grace Church aligns. So here we go. This is my stammering attempt. In the story of the Bible, we learn that God is a God who wants to be with us. Relationally, He wants to be known by each of us. But there's a dilemma. The gospel reveals that all of us have offended God. Knowingly or unknowingly, at some point, all of us have rebelled against His authority. We're all afflicted, as it were, with a curvature of the soul that God calls sin. We've preferred other things more than God. So, left to ourselves, we become distant from God. We drift from Him. We're separated relationally from Him. But God never forgot us. God never forgot us. He took the initiative to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And so on the stage of history... He sent Jesus Christ. Jesus left all the privilege that was his to enjoy in heaven and he came humbly to a nondescript little town in a world that was a mess, a world that was convulsing. In sobering and stunning fashion, the earthly life of Jesus led very purposefully one day to a cross outside the city of Jerusalem. Yet it was all according to plan. It was according to plan. It was in keeping with God's redemptive plan. And something really extraordinary happened at the cross. A first century follower of Jesus named Paul 
puts it like this. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to become, as it were, sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What Paul is saying is there was a great exchange that happened at the cross. An extraordinary, breathtaking exchange. At the cross, God the Father took off of God the Son, Jesus, or placed on Him, let me say, all of my sin, all of the sin of those who would trust Him. He places it all on Jesus, and Jesus shoulders my sin at the cross. And if that weren't stunning enough, then God the Father does something additional. He takes off of Jesus His perfect righteousness, and He places it on me. It was a great exchange. My sin for Christ's righteousness. Not exactly a fair swap, but an extraordinary expression of divine love. That's all contained in this gospel around which Grace Church aligns itself. And then God confirmed and validated Jesus' triumph by raising him from the dead. The tomb is empty. And he's alive. There were eyewitnesses on the stage of history that saw Jesus alive after his crucifixion. This is all what God has done. God has done all of this. Can take your breath away. Now, now, in a series where we're talking about I want to be a church member. Membership in the church is composed of people who have embraced this good news in the gospel and personally trusted Jesus. Jesus Christ is the epicenter of good news. That's who he is. Healthy churches are composed of people who trust, love, and follow Jesus. We love Him because He first loved us. We serve others because Jesus first served us. We reach because Jesus first reached for us. And we pray because Jesus first prayed for us. And that brings us to a focus for today. You see, followers of Jesus transformed by the gospel are being apprenticed in prayer, learning to pray. One of the core values at Grace Church relates to prayer. You see it on the screen. We believe that prayer is essential to the life and ministry of the church. That's not original with me. That is one of the core values that's been established and observed at Grace for years. We believe that prayer is essential to the life and ministry of the church. This is a core value here. Consistent with this value, one week from tonight, we're planning to gather together in this room for a, a concert of prayer where we gather to pray about big objectives on the heart of God and we want to do it side by side together in agreement. We're going to come and uh, worship. Give ourselves to honest adoration of God. It's good and right to celebrate Him. 
And we're going to pray for awakening in the church, that the church would be healthy and vital, increasingly alive to Christ. And we're going to pray for advance of the gospel in the world. That's a week from tonight at 6 in this room. Now, for me personally, as an outsider who for about four months now, you very graciously welcomed and treated as though I was an insider, I can tell you that I have prayed this week that the core value of prayer will become more and more deeply embedded in the soul of Grace Church. Relational desire for God and prayer as an expression of reliance on Him. Consider this sample of references to the priority of prayer. They're going to be on the screen. In Colossians 4.2 we read, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Romans 12.12 12, Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Constant in prayer. James 5.16 Therefore confess your sin to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. There it is. Pray for one another. Because you see, what happens in prayer is prayer affirms relationship with God and prayer pursues the favor of God's blessing into the lives of others around us. Prayer is without question a meaningful investment that each of us can make in the life of the church. Now today in our teaching series on church membership, we want to give some attention to a specific type of prayer that has strategic implications. It's prayer for church leaders. Prayer for church leaders. Now here's my plea this morning. And I hope you hear my heart. Here's my plea. Please don't interpret this as a self-serving appeal. Instead, my hope, my longing is that you will receive this message as a strategic and tactical manifesto. Please hear this challenge that I believe comes from God's word through my lips this morning. Hear it through the lips of a brother in Christ who is not a resident pastor with you. I think most of you know I live in Door County, Wisconsin. Every Saturday I drive 160 miles on the weekends when I'm here. And I drive back uh, Mondays most weeks. This week I'm going to drive back on Wednesday. So I'm not a resident pastor with you. I'm asking you to thoughtfully commit to new measures of resolve to pray for pastors and elders and deacons in, at Grace Church. And here's why. We're in a battle. We're in a battle. God has promised us victory. That has not meant that there's not a battle. What he's promised is victory that we'll receive and experience in full one day and we're going to experience and taste measures of it here and now. But the battle continues here and now. The Bible straightforwardly tells us so. We're promised that one day we're going to share fully in the triumph of Jesus. And one day that triumph will be decisive and final. However, until that day, we are engaged in an ongoing battle. One of the things I love about the Bible is it tells us the truth. It doesn't sugarcoat or airbrush reality this side of heaven. We're told that we have a spiritual adversary. There is surely coming a day when our adversary Satan will justly and decisively and finally be vanquished. 
praise God. But until that day, there is battle. And our adversary, now watch this, is a tactical strategist. Now please, hear me out on this. Christian leaders are strategic targets in the battle. I want to say that again. Leaders are strategic targets of the enemy. Whenever a leader can be taken out, there's the possibility that the gospel platoon served by that leader suffers and becomes more vulnerable. We're always vulnerable this side of heaven. But in that kind of an environment where a leader has been taken out by the evil one, there is more vulnerability. This principle of tactical warfare was, <laughs> interestingly, in illustrated in the movie Forrest Gump. In that movie, there was a Forrest Gump played by Tom Hanks and Bubba played by McKelty Williamson and Lieutenant Dan played by Gary Zanisi. And Forrest Gump and Bubba, Bubba uh, enlist in the army and they are sent to Vietnam. And when they arrive in Vietnam and meet their platoon leader, Lieutenant Dan, for the first time, reflexively, they salute. And Lieutenant Dan is just coming out of his tent and he insistently implores them to never salute him out in the open again. Remember that scene? He puts their hands down. Don't ever salute me out in the open. Why would he say that? Lieutenant Dan continues, there are snipers all around that would like to take out a leader. And just as was true, on the big screen in a movie that was made 25 years ago, in any battle, tactical strategy involves wanting to take out leaders. Now it's true that all of us in the body of Christ are in need of prayer. Can we agree about that? All of us are in need of prayer. Can I get a witness? And we're all urged to pray for one another. This morning, what I want to do is simply underscore the urgent tactical importance of praying church leaders. Because leaders can become tactical targets. The Apostle Paul was not bashful about this. Check this out from Romans 15.30. It's on the screen. I appealed to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. The Apostle Paul is urging Christians in the church in Rome to partner with him in his mission by praying for him. He'd been around the block long enough to realize that he needed prayer coverage. This is the way Romans 15.30 reads in the NIV translation. It's also going to be on the screen. This is now from the NIV, Romans 15.30. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Join me in my struggle by praying. I'm just going to say to you as one who's had the great privilege, the great privilege to serve in Christ's church as a leader for over 30 decades, leadership is hard. And I'll tell you this, it's getting harder. Leadership is hard. And this apostle who wrote nearly half of the books in the New Testament and who was being powerfully used by God in bearing witness to Jesus all over the Mediterranean world was keenly 
aware of his need for prayer coverage. He wasn't so arrogant or presumptuous as to think that he had arrived. He was continually aware of his need for prayer. And he intimates that brothers and sisters in Christ could meaningfully partner with him in his work by praying for him. Friends, as heartfully as I know how, I'm just saying, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. This is a big deal impacting the welfare and the health of the larger church. What Paul was saying implicitly is that we're interdependent in the body of Christ. Specifically, he's saying that in the context of our partnership and fellowship with one another, all of us, all of us need prayer coverage. All of us do, including leaders. All of us need Jesus. And in the church, we all need one another. God has designed that in the church there would be a beautiful, refreshing interdependence that we share with one another. And by implication, this shouts, Christian leaders need the body of Christ. Leadership in God's design is never this. You know, Keeping people under your thumb. That's not leadership in any biblical sense. Leadership in a biblical sense, you put a towel around your waist and you take a basin of water and you serve people. That's leadership. And leaders need the body of Christ. John Piper has written this concerning the Apostle Paul. I just read this this week. One measure of the greatness of a man is not only that he practices what he preaches, but also that he doesn't consider himself above the ordinary means of grace that all Christians need, including the fellowship of other believers. Paul bears his authority and power and reputation without pretense and freely admits his need for the refreshment of Christ that comes through other believers. His humble need for and delight in the friendship and partnership of others makes him all the more winsome. And given the reality of the spiritual battle that rages all around us, just behind the curtain that we can see with our physical eyes, it's wise for us to think and operate strategically as a fellowship of believers. It's wise for us in the battle to affirm with gratitude and with joy that God himself has given to us the tool of prayer. And we've been saying that we're in a battle. And I want to read for you now a passage. It's not going to be on the screen. Some of you may want to turn there. It's in Ephesians chapter 6. But for those of you who don't have a Bible or a Bible app on your phone, I want you to just to listen to this. So, you know, I'm not making this up when I say we're in a battle. God has told us this. Ephesians 6 is a passage that focuses on the reality of spiritual battle all around us and it emphasizes the unique and adequate equipping God has provided to us in the church as we choose to courageously follow Jesus. Beginning at verse 10 of Ephesians 6. This is for the whole church. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, by the way, whenever you see that word therefore, There's a question you ought to ask. What's the therefore, therefore? 
It connects what's just been said with what's about to follow. In light of that reality, the reality of battle, therefore, because that's true, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. To this point, to this point, Paul has mentioned the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And now there's one more component outfitting us for battle. Reading now verses 18 to 20, and these are on the screen now. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. In other words, prayer is needed by all of us. All of us need prayer coverage. All of us do. And then Paul says this, and also for me. He's acknowledging his own desperate need for prayer coverage. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in change in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Paul is urging in verses 18 to 20, prayer for everyone. We all need it. And he is not at all shy about saying, and I need it. I need you to pray for me. That whenever I open my mouth, I would fearlessly and fruitfully proclaim the good news of the gospel that can change lives, that can change eternities, can transform individuals and families. Paul is keenly aware of his own need as a leader for prayer. So, we don't have to be intimidated by this. But we're foolish if we ignore it. We're in a battle. And prayer is an essential commitment in a healthy church. Prayer for one another. And prayer for Christian leaders. Christian leaders need your prayer in teaching, in leading, in counseling, in planning, in shepherding, etc., etc., When a Christian leader teaches and leads fruitfully and effectively with both his words and his life, the whole church wins. The whole church benefits. Jesus is glorified and the gospel advances. Now while my desire this morning is that the Holy Spirit would kindle in all of us a renewed vigor for praying for one another, all of us, I'm also praying that the Spirit of God would seed in our hearts a readiness, desire, and conviction. Perhaps in some, for the very first time, a conviction about the importance, the tactical importance of praying for Christian leaders. Specifically, those who are serving as pastors, elders, and deacons at Grace. Currently, you have three gifted, serious Christ followers serving on your pastoral team here. 
And it has been my privilege to come alongside them and share life with them and coach them a bit through these last several months. I love them. And you have three elders, non-staff elders, who are serving grace at this time, providing oversight to the whole, pastoral team, accountable, directly accountable to them, certainly, direct, uh, certainly accountable to the whole body, directly accountable to the elders. You have eight deacons serving currently, overseeing areas of ministry in the life of the church. And what I want to um, specifically ask is that you would make some kind of resolve today to with some measure of regularity pray for them. And you might say, well, Tim, I mean, I want to, but, but, but how? And that's a fair question. That's a fair question. And this is what I want to encourage you to do. Consider, as you pray for them, praying back Scripture on their behalf. I've got two suggestions. One is for uh, the pastors and the elders to pray back 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7. That passage talks about the qualifications of an overseer. And if you were to go through each of those character qualities that are to be developed in an overseer, pray that those qualities would be more and more pressed into their lives. And for the deacons here, the eight deacons, in 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13, there are qualifications for deacons there. You could do the same thing. As you come across those qualities that are laid out, that are to be a part of their profile, pray those things, that they might get seeded more and more deeply into the lives of deacons here. But then there's one final passage of Scripture and I just I want to close with this. It's in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 3. And this is a passage that, I mean, maybe you could just jot down in your notes. If you've got a bulletin, will you just jot this reference down? 1 Peter 5, 1 to 3. It's going to be on the screen. 1 Peter 5, 1 to 3. This is the Apostle Peter writing. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. Not under compulsion, but willingly. There's a prayer request right there. That God's Spirit would be seeding more and more deeply in each of our pastors and elders a desire to willingly exercise oversight as God would have you. Not for shameful gain, but eagerly. There's another request that it would constantly be out of a, a longing, a desire, an eagerness to serve. Not domineering over those in your charge. In other words, none of this business. This doesn't befit a Christian leader. This doesn't befit a Christian leader. It's this, the towel around the waist and a basin of water ready to serve. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock that there would be integrity in their lives. And what I want to do right now is I want to lead us in prayer. I'm going to pray these three requests in 1 Peter 5, 1 to 3 for leaders. And I'm going to pray for the whole church, for all of you. And I'm going to pray for readiness for us as we come to this table this morning and we remember that Jesus is the epicenter of the gospel message that we announce and live out and we're going to remember that his body was given and his blood was shed. Let's pray together.
Father in heaven, you're a great God and it was your design. You're the one who conceived of the church. A place where those of us who belonged to you would also belong to one another. In our personal relationship with you, we would also have relationship with others. And Lord, we want to powerfully, meaningfully, fruitfully display you wherever you take us, certainly here in Delta County and beyond to wherever you might take us. Father, uh, and you've reminded us this morning of the tactical, strategic importance of praying for Christian leaders. So specifically right now, I want to pray for the staff and non-staff elders providing oversight here for John and Dave and Jordan and for Don and Scott and Dave. Lord, I pray that they would fruitfully shepherd the flock of God. Not under compulsion, but willingly. As you would have them serve. God, I pray that they would never do it for any kind of shameful gain, but they would eagerly discharge their call as leaders. Not domineering over anyone in the flock, but rather being examples. God, I pray that you would be so at work in their lives that there would be increasing measures of integrity. Integrity before you, credibility before the body. Lord, I also want to pray for the deacons that you've raised up in this place. God, that you would... Um, you would guard and protect them. That you would minister to them. That you would be developing in them those characteristics that we see in 1 Timothy 3, 8 to 13. And then God, I want to pray for the whole of the body here. We all need prayer coverage. We're in a battle. And God, we've, um, we've had an opportunity to hear the good news of the gospel Father, thank you that for many, many, many years, this fellowship here in Gladstone is oriented around this transformational message and around Jesus who's at the epicenter. God, I pray that each of us here with new resolve would want to contribute whatever we have to invest whatever we have into the life of the whole, the fellowship here, so that Jesus might be powerfully displayed in Delta County and beyond. And Father, as we uh, prepare now to come to the communion table, God, I would pray for myself and every person here, you would deliver us from mechanically going through the motions. Rather, God, help us to remember Jesus. And remember what he's done and to worship you and give thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.